Hi, I'm Rick. I'm a grateful believer of Jesus Christ. When I was nine years old, I was abducted. I was put into a trunk of a car. The man was going to kill me. For uh, whatever reason, uh, he let me go. From that point on, I was very disturbed growing up. I was uh, full of hate. I had no God in my life. I didn't realize the PTSD that it caused me. Later in life, I joined the Air Force. Uh, I became a loadmaster, uh, flying combat missions into Iraq and Afghanistan. I had no idea what that was doing to my brain at the time. In uh, 2010, I had a major mental breakdown. Wound up in the first mental ward uh, that I was in. I moved here to Lake Havasu in 2012. Started attending Calvary. I was outside the church looking in. Uh, not reading any scripture, uh, not really getting into the Bible at all. Still very angry uh, and uh, didn't know how to react to people. In uh, two years ago, I got two, or I got four back injections in my back. <clears throat> and I didn't know it, but cortisol steroids can cause psychosis. Well, I went into psychosis. I was in psychosis for a total of three months. I actually thought I was Jesus Christ. I was attending the church here, and I did some pretty outlandish things. I don't remember any of it. Uh, and I wound up getting banned. I was in psychosis so bad that I didn't even remember my own baptism. When I got out of the last mental ward, I was very lonely. I was lost, ashamed, felt so guilty because I couldn't remember what I'd done. I went for about three months uh, in that condition. Uh, they finally got my meds right and I finally started thinking straight. And I'd ask my wife, I want to go back to church. She got a hold of Chad and he said, by all means, come back. Uh, I made it a point I, uh, to start reading scripture every single day. Um, and I started reading scripture every day. I read it to my wife. I uh, started to uh, serve in the church. The first uh, thing I served in was Night to Shine at, at our schools this year. I also started a life group. Uh, my whole life has started to change. Um, I no longer hate anyone. I don't know where that hate went. All I know is I had a complete transformation. I want to read something here out of Romans 12. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. If you're struggling with mental illness in any way, shape, or form, what I want you to know is you're welcome here at Calvary. It doesn't matter what's happened to you. It doesn't matter how ashamed you feel, how guilty you feel. Uh, Calvary is a place uh, for people to change. It's a place where people love you until you can love yourself. That's what's happened to me here and I hope that can happen to you. You know, I love the stories of life change here at Calvary. I'm so proud of Rick and Renee and uh, just the, the change in his life and the way that God has been leading them. And I just got to let the cat out of the bag. You know, he mentioned that he didn't even remember his baptism uh, from about three years ago. And so uh, tomorrow morning, uh, his wife Renee is confessing Jesus for the first time publicly in baptism. And he is going to get baptized again so he can remember it. So isn't that cool? You know, we're, uh, we're continuing our series called Transformed, and, and this is about how God can change anyone from any place, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, God wants to work in your life. He wants to bring you to that place of health, and, uh, and, and we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, and I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Mark chapter 5. Now, if you're in the room and you don't have a Bible, uh, there's Bibles in the seats around you. Grab one of those, turn to page 998, and you can follow along with Mark chapter 5. Uh, if, uh, if you're joining us from home then, uh, and you don't have a Bible and you want one, uh, let us know. We'll get you a Bible. We'll deliver it. We'll send it to you. We'll do whatever it takes so that you have the Word of God 
and can read it. And if you're here and you don't own a Bible and you want one, then take one of those with you because we want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. So the Gospel of Mark chapter 5 tells the story of a man radically changed by Jesus. I mean, he was out of control. He was a threat to himself and others. He was actually possessed by a legion of evil spirits. The people in his community went so far as to even chain him up, you know, uh, and left him to die, but he was so filled with rage that he broke the chains and he continued to be self-destructive and a threat to the people around him. Um, and that was how he was right up until the moment that he met Jesus. Mark chapter 5 gives us the details about his life, about uh, this out of control kind of place. But this raging wild demoniac fell at Jesus' feet and begged for mercy. This guy that was completely out of control, completely out of his mind, he fell at Jesus' feet and begged for mercy. And of course the story is Jesus cast the demons out of this man. The demons actually asked Jesus for mercy. And so Jesus sent them into a herd of pigs. The herd of pigs rushed down the, the hill into the water, drowned. Uh, the, t the guys watching the pigs ran back into town, told everybody what happened. They came out. They weren't really thrilled with Jesus. They actually ended up asking him to leave. But the story picks up in verse 14. I just want to look at 14 and 15. This is what I want us to focus on. It said, The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And the people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion of demons in him, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Clothed and in his right mind, because he had a life-changing encounter with Jesus. I love that phrase, in his right mind. Um, because as we continue our Transform series, today we're talking about how God wants to transform our mental health. He wants to change our minds. In other words, that really blunt to just put it for all of us, Jesus wants to change your mind. Okay, Jesus wants to change your mind. Uh, if you are a follower of Jesus, and by that I mean that you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, and he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then Jesus wants to change how you think. He wants to change your mind and the way you process information. He not only forgives our sin, but he wants to correct our thinking. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but we naturally, because of being sinners, think wrong. Now, I know everyone in this room believes they're right. Okay? You guys all believe you're right? Anyone here just know, hey, I like to argue wrong positions just for fun? No. You, see, we all believe we're right. But um, truthfully, you're wrong. And so am I. I'm wrong. And it's because of sin that we're wrong. It's not a condition that you chose to be wrong. You just are wrong because you're a sinner. See, the Bible describes God as being righteous. It's one of his attributes. It's one of his eternal attributes of God. It's not something he does. It's something that he is. And the root word for righteous is what? Right. You guys are right that it's right. In other words, God is right always. It's his nature to be right to be correct. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the truth. Why? Because he's always right. He is righteous. Do you know what word the Bible uses to describe us? Unrighteous. It actually says, hey, uh, there is no one righteous, not even one of you. Not even one of us is righteous. So if we are unrighteous, what does that mean? We are un... Yeah, we're unright. There's another... We don't use the word unright very often. We usually use the word wrong. That's right. So I want you to look at the person right next to you that's seated there, smile and say, you are unright. <laughs> now, see, you, you try that at home later on and it won't be so much humor involved in that. 
Might wanna start using that just to remind people that we're, we're, we're not thinking clearly because of sin. We, we need Jesus to change our minds. And, and by the way, we need Jesus to change our minds because a wrong mind is, self, is destructive to self and others, okay? We're self-destructive and we're harmful to other people. We're selfish. We're greedy. We're mean. We're angry. We're violent. We're proud. All of those things and more. We, we hurt ourselves by our choices, by the way that we think, and we hurt other people by the, the way that we think. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 6, uh, the apostle Paul said, for the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Let me say that again. The mindset on the flesh is death. So when we, when we operate out of our you know, naturally sinful, wrong-thinking minds, it results in destruction for us and for other people. That's, that's just reality. The man in Mark chapter 5, he embodied that to the extreme. He was so wrong in his mind, in his thinking, because of the evil spirits inside of him, that, that he, he could not do anything constructive. He was only destructive. And while he is the extreme version, he represents all of us and the dark places in our minds. Now think about it. We all know people who are bent on destruction or we've been those people who've been bent on destruction, right? Addicts, lying and stealing from your own family in order to feed your, your uh, you know, urge to self-destruct. I know that you think, oh, that's what I need, but it's just killing you slowly, sometimes quickly. How about those people who are greedy, who are willing to destroy relationships, whether it's the lives of employees or friends or, or families, in, other to, in order to get more money. It's especially tragic watching families fight over money after funerals. When there's already grief and sorrow and pain and to just turn on one another. Or what about the perverse? Using others for your own sexual pleasure. It doesn't matter if it's in person or through pornography, it, it still is self-destruction and it hurts others as well. And see, Jesus wants to forgive us when we confess him as Savior and Lord, but he also wants to change our minds. He wants us to be healthy in our thinking because the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. I really want you to memorize Romans 8, 6, okay? Can I just say that? I really want you to get that. So Romans 8, 6, write it down. It's the mindset on the flesh is death, and the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. And I know it's not your prescribed verse to memorize this week, but it's, it just helps me to just frame things when I start thinking about being stupid, okay? And it'll help you to frame, think about things differently if you just go, hey, the mindset on the flesh is death. I, it's gonna lead someplace I don't wanna go but a right mind is surrendered to Jesus. Okay, the mindset on the flesh is death, but the right mind is a mind that is surrendered to Jesus. I love the fact that the people showed up in the story in Mark 5, and the demoniac was in his right mind. He was in his right mind. He was transformed from out of his mind to being at peace. Why? Because of Jesus. He was in the presence of Jesus. He had surrendered to Jesus. We see that transformation. Another transformation that we see in Scripture is the Apostle Paul, who began his story in the Bible as one who hated the church, who hated Jesus, who persecuted Christians, who was filled with hatred and violence and anger. Until when? Until he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He didn't even know it was Jesus. He asked, who is this? And Jesus had to tell him, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And suddenly he had a transformation in how he thought as his world was suddenly turned upside down. And today my hope is that you will surrender your mind to Jesus because it leads to life and peace. Okay, I'm just telling you, I got, a, I got an agenda as I'm sharing this. Whether you're watching at home or watching in the room, uh, I, I want you to surrender your mind to Jesus. That's where I hope that you get to. Now, before we proceed, I need to be very clear about something. If you have a mental health diagnosis, whether that is depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, OCD, whatever it is, please consult your physician 
take your medications, continue with counseling, and surrender to Jesus. Okay, do all of the above. This is not an either or, this is not, this is a both and kind of thing. So, Look, if you're on meds uh, to help you with anxiety or depression or, or some other mental health diagnosis, don't stop taking them. Don't listen to the lies of Satan that want to urge you towards self-destruction by saying, oh, if you really believed in Jesus, you wouldn't need the meds. Oh, if you really believed in it, if you were really a good Christian, you wouldn't have to go to counseling. Oh, if you're a really good Christian, then you wouldn't have to do all this stuff. That is, that, that's just crazy. Sorry, we're talking about mental health. I'm not supposed to use the word crazy. It's really one of my goals, to get through the entire sermon and not use the word crazy. So I blew that one, didn't I? So anyway, you try it sometime. It's like preaching while you're playing a game of taboo. So, uh, but, but here's the thing. Uh, if, if you're on meds, it's just like me being on blood pressure meds. Look, I tried all kinds of ways to get my blood pressure down. I did everything the doctor said except give up Diet Pepsi. And... Uh, <laughs> I drew the line there and said, I can drink Diet Pepsi and take pills, and then give me the pills, okay? So I'm on blood pressure meds. It's like somebody who's a, who's a diabetic. They need insulin, okay? It it's, it's not, doesn't make you a worse Christian because you need some things to help you function and be healthy. So don't, don't look at this as, I don't want you to misconstrue this in any way. I want you to surrender your mind to Jesus, but if you need the other things to, to function, you heard Rick talk about getting his meds right. You heard Rick talking about the chemical thing. See, mental illness often has physical roots, has chemical imbalances, brain injuries, and, and those coupled with traumatic experiences. You heard Rick refer uh, to several of his that cause PTSD. Look, medication is a great answer. So uh, don't, don't think that that uh, makes you less of a Christian if you need meds, okay? Just see your doctor, take your meds, get the counseling, and surrender to Jesus. Because Jesus wants to change all of our minds. All of us. He wants to move us from being unright toward being in our right minds. Um, so, let me just ask a question. You guys answer at home if there's people watching with you. Do you want a right mind? Okay, so you want Jesus to change your mind. Okay, then let's talk about the process of thinking differently. The process of thinking differently. Uh, and I'm sorry, it is a process, okay? It is not an instant thing where suddenly you surrender to Jesus, Jesus have my mind, and he just like zaps you with lightning, and now you see everything clearly. Wouldn't it be nice if it was that way? But it's not. Okay, it might be that way for like one out of, you know, uh, a billion, but it's not, for, it hasn't been for me. So it's a process. Uh, and, and just like Plants grow and bodies grow and seasons change and, and all that kind of stuff. God wants to use a process to transform our minds. And so let me talk about this process. It begins with intentional focus. Intentional focus. Psalm chapter one, the very first psalm that is written is kind of a foundational psalm. And it says this, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the path of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. For he is like a tree planted by streams of water, yielding its fruit in its season, its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Okay, there's a contrast there, I hope you see it. The, don't, don't hang out with people who are gonna lead you astray. Don't hang out with people who don't honor God. But don't get caught up listening to the crowd, but instead be blessed, be the person who doesn't walk in, the, in that way. Be the person who intentionally focuses on God's word. His delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law meditates day and night. You gotta focus on God's word. Hey, there's a reason we get Bibles away here. Because we want you to focus on God's word. It's a high priority to us. Why? Because if you read God's word, God will change your life. Why? Because it's truth. Okay, it tells us what to believe and how to live. And if you do it, then it changes your life. So focus on God's word. By the way, we're trying to help you do that through the daily devotions in the transformed book. I know we only got a thousand of those out and there's you know, two to three thousand people that are part of this. But uh, you know, reading that daily devotion, it helps you to focus on God. 
Uh, you know, it, 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 it's thinking about God's wisdom. That's what meditation is. When he says meditates on his word day and night, it's not sitting there trying to empty your mind thinking about nothing. It is thinking about the truths that are there in God's word, but you can't meditate on God's word unless you actually focus on God's word and get some of it in your mind. And, you know, so, uh, you know, I hope throughout your day you're listening to worship music, maybe you're listening to podcasts or sermons, uh, doing something that is good, that is getting truth into your mind. Because if you do not purposely focus on God's word, you're going to get swept along with the lies of the world. You did see the contrast in Psalm 1, right? You're blessed if you don't get caught up in the lies of the world. Walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the path of sinners, sit in the seat of mockers. Okay, if you're not doing that, what are you doing? You're thinking about the things of God. So you're going you're gonna to choose a path. Which way is it going to be? So intentional focus and then intentional learning. The process involves learning. Our theme verse for the entire Transform series is Romans 12 two. I love the fact that Rick read that as part of his testimony. Do not be conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Did you get that? Don't be conformed to the image of this world, the culture, the prevailing wisdom, the conventional wisdom, but be transformed. I don't know if they knew that Paul was going to, you know, we were going to have a sermon series based on Paul's inner word. But be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind, letting Jesus change your mind. And, and how do you do that? Well, you invite God to teach you. You invite God to teach you. Why? Because we settle into patterns of thinking. We settle into beliefs. Some of them are right and some of them are wrong. And because of sin, we're not always sure which ones are which. And the only way to change our minds is to say, God, I know I'm unright and I need you to teach me. So speak truth into my life through your word and through your people so that I can know the truth so that it can transform how I think, so that I can prove what is God's perfect good and wonderful will. So how does God teach us? Again, this is not rocket science. You guys know this answer. If I just said, hey, what are all the ways that God teaches us, uh, his word, his truth, uh, then you'd get it right. So it's through reading the Bible. It's through studying scripture. It's through memorizing scripture. Okay, I'm gonna walk on thin ice right here. Because I I know how this conversation goes. If I say to you, hey, each week in the Transform book, there's a memory verse, one per week. One verse per week. Are you guys memorizing them? I like that trying. Thank you. At least there's a positive statement there right there. Most people are just looking down suddenly. (laughs) Don't look at him. That way he doesn't know. Look, the answer usually is, I can't memorize stuff. I can't memorize any. I'm I'm no good at memorizing. You know why we're no good at memorizing? Because we don't try. Because we don't even try. Let's just, oh, I just can't do it. Yes, you can. You find your way home, and when you stop finding your way home, then they, you know, call it Alzheimer's and put you in a home. (laughs) Lock the doors from the outside so you can't get out. See, you you can memorize. You just have to decide this is important, and I'm gonna do it. Okay, it's not too late to start. There's only three so far, right? And this is one of them. Don't be conformed. I just told you what this one is. Last week it was, you know, do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? You were not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. You know, they're important because they allow God to speak to you, but you've got to learn intentionally. That's why life groups are so important. So you can study together and share and listen and hear other people's stories. That's why worship is so important, to purposefully engage the message. I love the fact that so many of you take notes. You actually actively are trying to listen to God, whether it's through the preaching or the music or the prayer or communion. So we intentionally focus, we intentionally learn, and, and then we've got to intentionally apply. James 1.22, so simple. James says, be doers of the word, and not hearers only, and so deceive yourselves. Oh. See, I, I mean, for a long time, I just heard the, you know, be doers of the word, not hearers only, blah, blah, blah. And, and then I started, that was when I was working with teenagers, okay? And then I started to hang out with adults, and I realized how important that last part is. 
Because we are so good at lying to ourselves, aren't we? Oh, if I eat that pint of ice cream, it's not going to really make me fat. That's true. One pint's not. It's one pint every night that will. Right? The pants still fit, right? Because I use the extender on it. Anyway, so we, we lie to ourselves. But as you learn, you have to apply the Word of God or you are going to live in self-deception. By the way, the self-deception part is the prevailing issue with hypocritical Christians. Hypocritical churches. Churches that, that say all the right things but don't do them. That know the truth but have a bad attitude. That preach love your neighbor and they go to the stores and the restaurants and are mean to the servers. See, see that's the problem right there is because we're living in self-deception because we go, I know the truth, but the fact that you're not living the truth makes you a hypocrite. So if you focus on God and you learn about God, it's great, but if you don't do what God says, it's not good. It's part of the process. See, when we apply what we learn, that's where we meet God's power in our lives. And sometimes we go, I, I feel powerless. I, I want more of God's power. And it boils down to applying the small truths of God's word so that we can begin to understand how he works in our lives. And we meet him at that point of obedience. And God shows up at that point of obedience. And then we understand that God really means what he says. You know, it's like the whole forgive others as you've been forgiven by Jesus. And, and Jesus forgave you of everything. And you're like, yeah, I forgive everybody except this one person over here. I forgive everybody except this one thing that was done to me. And we think holding on to that one thing is not hurting us right up until the point where we actually practice forgiveness and God meets us there. We go, why was I holding on to that? It didn't help me at all. In fact, it was killing me because I was filled with hatred. See, it's, it's, uh, application is where we meet the power of God, and when we discover the power of God through applying the Word of God, then it makes us want to do it all the much more, and so we focus more on God, and we learn more about God, and we apply more of God's Word, and our lives are transformed because our minds are changed. And so we practice this process over and over and over again, and we learn to set our minds on the Spirit, and we reap the benefits of a changed mind, and, and I'm just going to say this. I know two weeks into Transform series, and some of you have already started to see a change because you started focusing on God with your mind. You started reading the devotions, and it's the first time in a long time or maybe ever that you've actually done daily devotions and read Scripture every day, and you're like, wow, this is really changing. And maybe your spouse has already noticed a change in attitude. Maybe your kids notice uh, a change in the, your approach, and, and uh, other people are cheering you on and, and because you're seeing it happen. But what are the benefits of a changed mind? What happens when we surrender our minds to Jesus? Let's talk about the results of a redeemed mind. Because there's actual good stuff that happens. In fact, there's way more good stuff that happens than I have time to talk about. So I'm just gonna mention a few. Okay, here we go. The first thing that happens uh, is that you're gonna prosper. You're going to prosper. Psalm 1-3 says... But he will be like, this is a person who, who meditates on God's word day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, yielding its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Whatever he does prospers. Now, the flesh in us, because I know how it is in me, goes, yay, I want to be rich. It's not what God says. It's not what he's saying. You know, you know, look, if you take God's principles and you apply them to your life financially, you'll be amazed at how God shows up in your life financially. Okay, that's just reality. And, and he will bless you and you'll be more prosperous than you are. But uh, here's the thing. It, it's, it's all aspects of life. And it doesn't mean you won't have problems or sickness or failure or loss, but it does mean you will experience God's power to redeem and you'll be healthy in your family and you'll be healthy in your job, you'll be healthy with your friends. You'll be healthy completely because your leaf isn't gonna wither. You're, you're gonna yield fruit on a regular basis. Your life is gonna be fruitful and, and, and that's a, uh, an awesome blessing. 
And the longer you practice this, and the more you do it, the more you trust God, then the more you're going to prosper in life. So you're going to prosper. So if you want to be prosper, listen to Psalm. Again, you got to memorize Psalm 1, 1 through 3. Just, again, healthy thing. I think I want you guys to memorize all the Bible. I haven't found a bad verse, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of good ones. So anyway. So you'll prosper. That's one of the results of a redeemed mind. Secondly, you'll have peace. Everybody wants peace. Even people who don't know Jesus want peace. Isaiah 26.3 says, You keep him. He's talking about God. God keeps him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him because he trusts in you. Okay, when we trust in God, we keep our mind focused on God, and God keeps us in peace. Again, it all goes back to our minds. Or what are we thinking about? What are we focused on? So if we trust in God and we focus on God, then God's going to give us peace. So the more you focus on God's word and live out his wisdom, the more peace you're going to experience in your life. There is a direct correlation. And I'm not talking about external calm. The world is still crazy. Jobs are still stressful. Kids are still wild. Okay? It's not going to make those things change. But we experience the peace of Christ in the midst of that. Knowing that God is with us, knowing that God loves us, knowing that God is gonna redeem us and God has a place for us so when the world brings its worst, we still know it can only get better. See, that's where peace comes from. It's knowing that God has you and God's gonna take care of you, not just in this world, but beyond this world. So that whatever this world brings does not threaten you. It may be a threat to your body, but Jesus addressed that when he said, don't fear those who can only kill the body. I <laughs> love Jesus, don't you? <laughs> don't, don't worry about those people who can only kill your body. Only fear him who has the authority to cast body and soul into hell. Right? And if he's for you, then you don't have to worry about anything. So you're going to get peace. So the results of a redeemed mind, you're going to prosper, you have peace, and finally, you're going to live in freedom. You're gonna live in freedom. If you surrender your mind to Jesus, that process of focus and learn and apply, you're gonna live in freedom. Jesus said so. John chapter eight, verses 31 32, Jesus said, if you remain in my word or abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples. And you guys know the second part of this verse. And you will know the truth and... Yeah, the truth will set you free. Don't people love part of Jesus? They love to take Jesus out of context. We love to take Jesus out of context. The truth will set you free. What we usually mean by that is if you see the world the way I see the world, then you'll feel better about, I'll feel better about you anyway. If you agree with me that I'm right, yeah, I'll feel a whole lot better. No, that's not what Jesus says at all. The truth will set you free, yes, but what is the condition of that? You gotta abide Remain, live in Jesus' teachings. You gotta live in his teachings. If you live in his teachings, you're really his disciple. And then, because you're really his disciples, living in his teachings, you'll know the truth because you'll know Jesus and his truth will set you free. Your truth is just gonna lead you to a bunch of bad decisions. But his truth will set you free. See, this is so simple. The more you focus on God's wisdom, the more you learn of God's word, the more you apply it to your life, the more freedom you're going to experience. Not geopolitical freedom, but true freedom. The freedom from fear, the freedom from from, uh, the future, the freedom from the threats on the outside. Of course, the opposite is also true. The more you focus on the world's wisdom, the more you ignore God's word, the more you selectively apply God's word to your life, then you're gonna live in bondage and oppression and destruction. And here's the scary thing for us in, as Christians. We see other people living in freedom when we're not, and it frustrates us because we wonder, why in the world can't I have what they have? Because we're not focusing on God's word, we're not learning his wisdom, we're not applying it to our lives. It really is the process. And Jesus is inviting us to this. He says, I will change your mind if you will let me change your mind. So the choice is this. You can continue in a wrong mind, hurting yourself and the people around you. 
or you can surrender to Jesus and invite him to change your mind and commit to that process. It is the only path to freedom. Um, so which path are you going to choose? Because the choice is yours. Let's pray. God, I am thankful that we are on your mind and you want to give us the mind of Christ. You want us to have the same attitude, the same mind as was in Christ Jesus. And God, that doesn't happen because we say a prayer. It doesn't happen because we uh, write notes on a sermon. It doesn't happen because we, uh, you know, walk forward in church or anything like that. It happens because we embrace you as Savior and Lord. We follow you daily. We make it a habit to, to invite you to change our mind. We learn from your word and we apply it. So God, meet us here tonight. Meet us here in this place, whether our, this place is the church building or our homes, and speak truth to us because we want freedom and we need you to teach it to us. So we surrender. We surrender our hearts, we surrender our minds, we surrender our wills, we surrender ourselves as living sacrifices, asking that you would change us in Jesus' name, amen.